Namaste and good morning, everyone. Let's start our Wednesday class with some prayers. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Parbrahma, Tasmay Shri Guru Venamaha, Om Bhu Bhavaswaha, Tatsavitra Vareneyam, Bargo Deva Sedi Mahi, Diyo Yonaha Prachodayat, Asto Ma Satgamya, Tamso Ma Jyotir Gamya, Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamya, Om Senavavatu, Senavunatu, Saviriam Karvavahi, Tejasvi Navadit Mastu Ma Vidveshavahi, Om Shanti 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 Today's topic I have chosen that what is the purpose of human life? Okay, because we got to learn how to live purposefully. Because we know in all of the material creation, the human is the potentially brightest creature. Because among all creatures, it alone possesses the capacity for God realization. That means to realize God, to know God, to become God, human beings. And it's actually a mark of great fortune to be born as a human being. That's why when people say, I feel like a failure in my life. This life is no good. They need to get out of that mode. Because liberation or mode can be attained only in this form of existence. Only the human body is a fit vehicle for obtaining a motion. So that's why it's a great fortune to be born as a human being. So remember that. The relative evolutionary level of human existence lies in between that of the devatas and animal life. The devatas possess only subtle bodies, the vishirir, and so cannot uh, endeavor for liberation. Although they have only happiness to experience, they are not yet free from the law of karma. They have attained birth in the higher heavenly realms due to their good karmas of previous human lives like a punne karma. When the stock of good karmas is exhausted, they also must return to this earthly plane to be reborn as a human being. And the animal possess uh, physical bodies. Uh, they cannot fully activate their psychic or subtle centers. They lack the capacity for discrimination, which is called Vivek, intelligence, both of which are of utmost importance in the process of realization of God. So Vivek also, and to know our subtle centers also. Animals, they can obtain a human birth only after a very long evolutionary process. It may take thousands or perhaps even millions of years for them to attain that level of development. In human body, the network of subtle energy channels and centers of the ethereal body can fully unfold. And in our inner instrument, which is called Antekaran, we can find its full potential expression. So these are very powerful bodies God has given it to us as a human being. 
physical body also and that subtle body also. Because such a body, if properly employed in spiritual endeavors, it is capable of divinizing its owner. And in this way, a human can realize through actualization of personal spiritual potential. Because that's how our equipment is shaped. We are made in the image of God and the likeness of God. But remember that. So a human can be said to be a potentially divine. That's why we are called children of God or a child of God. The individual, as human beings, all of us should strive intelligently and sincerely for our final goal of life. God realization. According to the Indian philosophy, there are four purposes to life. Or four goals of life. The first one is called earth, the pursuit of material abundance. That is one of the goal. Not the final goal, just one of the goals. The second one is called calm, a desire for sensual enjoyments. Third one is called dharam. The quest for harmony through an ethical and moral life based on Eternal religion, Sanatan Dharam, and then moksha, liberation, freedom. The quest for wealth, possessions, livelihood, financial security reflects economic and civic tendencies that can cause an individual to seek fulfillment through the medium of monetary rewards. That is what's called earth. To be able to pay your bills, to be able to take care of your family, to be able to take care of this body, earth. And the pursuit of a sensual and emotional satisfaction usually finds its ideal mode of representation in the form of a committed relationship in which we love and pleasure can find full expression in a family environment. This desire also indicates the striving for power and influence, whether it's at home or at workplace. It's called calm. And the quest for inner as well as social harmony through the pursuit of ethical, moral, religious ideals reflects a love of integrity, loyalty, self-sacrifice, gentleness, and other moral and ethical strengths. Eternal religion, dharma, is what differentiates a human being from an animal. It is motivated by the serenity, happiness, and knowledge that accrue from genuinely ethical behavior. Ahinsa, Satya, Ste, Brahmachari, all that is ethical behavior and the practice of willful spiritual techniques. Yagya, Dan, Tap. Through the mastery of dharam, an individual makes the luminous, radiant quality of sattva in his or her nature, the swabhav, and develops the qualities necessary for the pursuit of liberation. So these are the three ladders, the lower ladders. We got to understand. Financially, be secure. Emotionally, 
also be calm about it. Fulfill your desires. That means no more desires. Live a life which is based upon ethics and morality. Life of a yogi. Then the fourth stage, the liberation is the final and ultimate goal of life. It is the arising of craving for the supreme awakening of self-realization. That means when you just keep on thinking about it, it has to arise in our mind first. It begins to arise only after a soul has passed through repeated incarnations of preoccupations with the three lower aims of life. Remember that. That's why you see that some people have that as their prime goal. Others don't. Because we are not all at the same level in this journey. Because when you become tired of these first three goals, And after realizing their inherent shortcomings, you want to attain the final goal. So it is through experience and mastery of the three primary goals that humanity fully actualizes humanness, sustaining the family and society in the process. So that means you don't have to run away from your family. You don't have to run away from the society. Take care of all that. But your personal goal is that highest goal. The liberation. And only after attaining this state of evolutionary maturity does the soul then set its sights on liberation. That's why I always tell you, one eye should always be on this final goal the ultimate pinnacle of human achievement and the ultimate purpose of existence. From this, it becomes evident that a rare human birth, a healthy body and a discriminating intellect combined with a fully awakened desire for release from the limitations of a conditional existence are very necessary prerequisites for liberation. That's why a yogi guru says, take care of this body. Don't neglect it. Keep your mind clean, heart pure, intellect sharpened. Keep all the equipments ready to shoot for that final goal, liberation. Real happiness, because we often talk about happiness, the real happiness and unending peace can be obtained only when the soul is freed from all bondage and has assumed its perfected form, which is called a Siddha, which is forever beyond the realms of limitations and suffering. That is the real nature of Atma. But because of the ignorance, it feels trapped. So the real happiness and unending peace will only come from there. Now the question is, where does real happiness lie? Because we all want happiness. We all want eternal happiness. That's called the real happiness. Real happiness is the unending stream of bliss that lies in the freedom beyond dualities. Duality means the pairs of opposites. A bound individual has no choice but to shift his or her composite worldview from the shades of contrast that lie between subjectively perceived pairs of opposites. 
In order to transcend duality, a person must elevate beyond the pairs of good and evil, hot and cold, attachment and aversion. These are the pairs of opposites and comprehend non-duality. Non-duality makes no distinction between things. Because non-duality means that everything includes everything else. And the true happiness, the eternal happiness, or the real happiness can be experienced only in that perfect non-dual state of mind. Every human being, and we can check ourselves when we are not doing anything, check your heart. We are all longing and striving for this kind of a happiness, the real happiness. But we constantly making an attempt to find happiness according to our capacity, our level of development, and according to our level of understanding and discrimination. And again, discrimination means the intellect, the vivek, the way we can understand what is real, what is not real, what is true, what is not true. Most people seek happiness through sense enjoyments, which is called bhog. And they continue to do so until they realize there is a fundamental law of nature that makes lasting fulfillment through sensual pleasures impossible. Because all experiences of pleasure are balanced with equal and opposite experience of pain. That means no matter if somebody wants to seek that happiness by eating, they keep on eating, keep on eating, keep on eating. Until lately, there will be a pain. How much they can eat? Or even if somebody says, I want to find pleasure in seeing the mountains and the rivers and the oceans uh, traveling here and there. There's a limitation. So when we are seeking this ultimate happiness through the senses, we will fail. We'll get exhausted. That's why I said there's the opposite of this kind of a happiness, which is a pain. And this law is called a pendulum principle. The more you take it on one side, Pretty soon it will shift towards the other side too. Because this principle operates because of pleasure and pain are dualistic phenomena. And that exists only in relation to one another. It's like if there's a day, definitely there is a night. There's a happiness, then there's a pain also. So they are the opposite poles of a single phenomena. When we consciously seek out an experience of pleasure, what happens? We develop attachment for it. Yogis called it a rag, attachment. We then experience an equal amount of discomfort. In the absence of that pleasure, that's called the wish. So attachment and aversion, two pairs. If we increase the frequency and level of enjoyment, our attachment to the player and our aversion to its being absent increase proportionately, eventually leading us to a state of psychological addiction. Cannot live without it. 
very few people seek happiness by way of disciplining their bodies. Minds and intellects. We got to control all these. We got to keep them in anushashan. That's why Rishi Patanjali started that great Yoga Sutras with the very first Sutra, Atta Yoga Anushashanam. We are not a student of yoga unless our life is fully disciplined. This body in our control, mind in our control, intellect is in our control. Those who can make all three function optimally and in harmony can attain a real and lifelong happiness. These individuals are called yogis. Lifelong, not just during a retreat, not just in the presence of your guru, not just here and there. Lifelong. Because this kind of a person's sole object of endeavor is liberation. And that is the fourth and the final goal of human existence. Liberation. If our goal is not that right now, we haven't started walking on this path. Yogis have reached the point where they no longer consider the other three pursuits of life to be worthwhile. They do it out of habit. Sure, they will live a life of morality and ethical also. They don't beg. They'll pay their own bills. They will eat. But they'll always know that, hey, I'm doing all this to keep this body healthy. To give back to this society. Doesn't want to accumulate more. Because the final goal is so clear to a yogi. Because yogi knows that all these material things cannot bring permanent happiness and peace. And we know that throughout the age, ages, true saints, yogis and sages of all religions, all sects have proclaimed that real and everlasting happiness can be obtained only by overcoming all human limitations through God realization. Through communion and oneness with the universal spirit, which is the source of life, power, and bliss. So you got to learn how to connect with that. And we can connect with that only if we learn to disconnect from the temporary. We can walk ahead or up if we learn how to let go of the gravity or let go of the foot to move forward. So the ultimate purpose of human life and endeavor is the total manifestation of the inner self. Unfolded into perfect consciousness by transcending all the limitations. That's why when we sit in the meditation, temporarily, we tell ourselves that, hey, I am not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the intellect. I am the soul. We reinforce this idea until it becomes our experience. Additionally, the individual soul can be integrating the opposites of nature, breaking down the barriers created by the ego to realize the difference between the ego personality and the true self. Ego personality means when we say, I am this body, I have accomplished this, I am this and that. And the true self is uh, the soul. Distinction between these two should be clear to us. Such a development is possible only through the practice of yoga, not by indulgence in sense enjoyment. In that 
indulgence, we forget who we are. But in the practice of yoga, we are more and more aware of who we are. Yoga is the spiritual way of life, while the pursuit of a sense enjoyment is the conventional way of life. Conventional way means most of the people live a life like that. Very few people understand this life living with full awareness that I am the spirit. That's the yogi's life. Human beings through delusion fall prey to the deceitful allure of sense objects. That's why they say that Maya is so powerful. Most of us cannot even conceive what eternal happiness or bliss in life is. This is why people attempt to seek satisfaction through ordinary pleasures. While at the same time knowing in their hearts that there must be something more. It's almost like a mistaking a mirage for a pool of water. Or you can say that sense objects are like a baited hook, which ultimately appears attractive to a hungry fish, but ultimately proves painful when swallowed. But remember, we have a higher intelligence than a fish. So we should not fool ourselves with the sensual pleasures. All sense enjoyments are thus illusory and in the end create nothing but misery. With their false promises, they form the very basis of earthly existence for mortal beings like us. But we are aspirants. We are the seekers. We are the students of yoga, we have to grow spiritually through the right endeavor on this path. And we'll see that with the sadhana, with this practice, eventually we'll, we will obtain the glimpse of real and the unlimited happiness. Everlasting fountain of happiness resides right inside us. You can call it a bliss. One who tastes real bliss always remains fully satisfied and peaceful. So if we have to judge ourselves, our sadhana, are we blissful and peaceful or not? Or do, are we depending upon the externals to give us happiness and peace? Check our self. Nobody, can, nobody else can check it. Only we can. Due to ignorance produced by the tamas, and we all are familiar with this tamas, tamas guna. A person entertains desire and craving and comforts the senses by indulging in their objects through the rajas guna. Okay? So tamsitta, that's inertia, that's darkness. But then we have some desire and craving. Hey, we have to get up. It's almost like you are sitting down. You don't want to get up, but you want to eat something. You get up and then make something for yourself. First to the tamas, then with the rajas, because of the desire. Desire and craving then lead a person to sense enjoyments. And these are the sources of discontent. So sure, the senses want something and you become active. On the other hand, a person who's meditating, already absorbed in the sattvikta or even above sattvikta, 
There's no discontentment. There's the everlasting pleasure and peace and bliss. Because when desires and cravings are not fulfilled, the mind becomes disturbed and restless. A discontented mind breeds anger. You want to eat something? It's not there. You thought you put it in the fridge, but somebody else ate it. You get angry. All of these destroy mental peace and make happiness impossible. Because this Rajsikta destroys the Satvikta in us. Satvikta is the very basis of happiness and knowledge, leading a person to disregard common sense and sink into the mud of doubt and illusion. This is why a wise individual cultivates only sattvic desires. And sattvic desire is what? To enhance the quality of mind and body. That's sattvic. I want to study something. I want to help somebody. I want to take care of this body. I would rather serve somebody than be served by somebody. So that's why Yogi Guru says, refrain from indulgence in sense pleasure. Because of course, when a particular desire is satisfied, temporarily you feel satisfied and happy, but this is a very illusory feeling of desirelessness and happiness. It very soon lapses into an often amplified version of the original condition of discontent and craving. Okay, so it's just like eh? adding the ghee into the fire. When we are trying to fulfill these worldly desires uh, and thinking that we'll get the eternal happiness. You plan a vacation, before you come back, you have already planned another one or two more or three more. You buy something, before you even bring it home, you already have seen many more things to buy. That's called amplified. A basic psychological principle of life is that in order to be totally happy, a person must let go of all needs, desires, and grievances. A person must train himself or herself to be satisfied with whatever comes naturally in and of itself. Only a person who has let go of attractions and aversions, rag and dvesh, is fit to attain the highest state of equanimity through yoga. This is called contentment. This is called santosh. Rishi Patanjali said, santoshat anuttam sukha labha. That is highest bliss, santosh. So Rishi Patanjali highlights this attitude of equanimity in yoga darshan. This is the verse which I just said. Second chapter, verse number 42, you can look at it. Supreme happiness can be gained from contentment, he says. Not by having more, thinking about more, not by amplifying your desires, but by feeling content. So in order to be established in yoga and obtain supreme happiness from there, person must first overcome the thirst and hankering for objects of desire. Because that is the very source of discontent. So real happiness abides in a contented and balanced state of mind. Because it can only be felt as a joy from within. Otherwise we are looking for a joy from outside. This is joy from within. So not through the external gratification of desire. 
So blissful happiness is inherent in every soul because that's what our real nature is. That's who we are, the soul. So that blissful happiness, which is called anand, can be experienced only when all forms of desires are renounced and the mind becomes perfectly content and serene through the practice of yoga. So how to reach their practice? That's a sadhana. In classical Indian philosophy, the life of an individual is ideally divided into four equal. Equal stages or successive stages, if I can say. In the first stage, which is called Brahmacharya, individual is devoted to the study of theoretical and practical knowledge while maintaining strict celibacy. Celibacy means control over your senses. You train these horses of yours during the Brahmacharya Ashram. And the second quarter of life is devoted to the householder stage, grist. And during this phase, a person can take the role of a responsible, usually married, fulfilling all social and professional obligations. So there are obligations because we have gotten so much from this universe. We are obligated to pay back also. So in the second stage in life, we pay back. And in the third, one prastha stage is a period of retirement in which a person turns over to all that, whether it's a business or whether it's a worldly responsibilities to the grown children now. That's what I was telling you the other day. Pass on the keys to the grown children. And gradually withdrawing oneself from worldly activities to turn outward the quest for spiritual enlightenment within. So that happens at a very high speed in the third stage in life, one prastashra. And the fourth and the last quarter of life is the renunciation, sannyasa. This is a fourth phase in life during which a person completely renounces worldly life. Severing all ties with family, wealth and property to enter the wholeheartedly the path of spirituality. I remember my own Guruji, he will not miss any election. He thought it was his civic duty. But when he entered the sannyasa, he would not. He says, I'm done with that. If we live our life according to these principles, then liberation is right here. We don't have to leave this body to feel mukta. We feel mukta. Liberated. The view of life means uh, that an individual is involved in social roles, worldly activities only during the first half of life. So that means in the Brahmachari Ashram and the Grist Ashram, sure, you're actively involved. During the final half of life, you have already tasted the life's impermanent bittersweet pleasures. We have to devote remaining years for attaining the ultimate goal of life. So third stage in life and the fourth stage in life. So it's like an inner quest we have to move towards. So what this means is that uh, while the final phase of life is the most inherently valuable of the four spiritual path is normally only accessible to those 
who have passed beyond the ignorance and passion of youth into the hard earned wisdom and realism of middle age. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Why should I let go of everything? I have worked so hard for it. It's mine. I cannot give away physically or mentally. So that's why I said a person can be successful only by properly understanding this. These two pursuits, the outer and the inner, See, like outer is the first two, inner is the second two stages in life are normally incompatible. Okay, normally what happens, we want to stay attached to the family and at the same time we want to be attached to God. It doesn't work that way. So that's why specific stages of life are assigned for each. Those who cannot yet turn away from society and worldly ambition, throwing of all the possessions, concerns, relationships, expectations, and anxieties should remain content with the practice of the discipline of some form of eternal religion, dharma. Because everybody is not ready for this. Which will transform and illumine a person's nature at a rate proportional to the effort expended. So that means you will spiritually grow. When the time comes to leave this body, the next time around, you will start your sadhana at a higher stage. The wholehearted quest for liberation is not for everyone. It is meant only for those few who are psychologically prepared to enter upon the last two stages of life, turning away from worldly concerns. Okay. Even of those who entered the third stage, of mentorship and gradual withdrawal from the responsibilities of family life, very few have the wear withal to enter the final phase of complete renunciation. It's, it's definitely difficult, especially if we have not done the preliminary work. Real renunciation, sannyas, is not just running away from normal responsibilities. For a carefree lifestyle, that's not renunciation. After letting go of all earthly ties and material possessions, a sannyasi is also expected to let go of all inner cravings for what has been left behind, which is very difficult, if not impossible, for most people. Only those who can see beyond limited personal motives and selfishness are fit to become true renunciates. So that, that's why Lord Krishna said that selfishness has to go, get out. Even when we are in a grist ashram, only then we are capable of exploring life's inner frontiers. So classical Indian philosophy divines the total abandonment of wealth, power, enjoyment, social relationships, career goals of all worldly activities as the precondition to embarking wholeheartedly upon the great spiritual endeavors. Okay, so it's not that we don't have to do that. In the first couple of stages in life, we go through all that. And the renunciation is not an end in itself. It's not just achieving that sannyas is the end. That's only a stepping stone for the attainment of perfect. 
quietude, the bliss, and attaining freedom from bondage. So that's also a stepping stone. From the point of view of yogic wisdom, the real and the ultimate purpose of human life is to secure bliss and liberation and peace. The Indian sages have also taught the way to reach this goal. So it's not that they just only told that this is the goal, but they gave us the path of yoga, classical path of yoga to attain that goal also. So they are not just leaving us in the midstream. Step by step, they tell us what to do and what not to do. What the goal is. And if you don't do the sadhana to achieve the goal, what will happen also, they tell us. In detail. And that's why it's very important to study the scriptures. They have the map for us, guiding maps. And that is the reason we sit over here every day to go through these maps so that we can have the burning desire to attain this moksha, the liberation. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaye Purnameva Visheshyate Om Shanti 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 Om Thank you very much.